business. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Edi Singh ji. Now, uh, the next speaker is Dr. Narendra Jadav. No, no, you can sit and speak, no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman, sir. I rise to strongly, or I sit, to strongly support the budget 2022-23. Uh, I wholeheartedly commend the Honorable Finance Minister for giving the nation a visionary budget aimed at inclusive and sustainable economic growth and development of the Indian economy. Vice Chairman, sir, a budget is supposed to strike a balance between economic acumen and political sagacity. The finance minister has struck a fine balance between the two. It is a no-nonsense budget reflecting professional integrity of the highest order. Every budget is always meant to be a contextual one. There are two overriding or dominant considerations that seem to have weighed on the Honorable Finance Minister's mind. First, the Indian economy has staged an exceptionally smart recovery, posting 9.2% real GDP growth, rising from the depth of the unprecedented corona pandemic. And the second, financial year 2023, that is the next year, it marks the beginning of the Amrut Kal when our nation will be transiting from India at 75 to India at 100. Both of these considerations, sir, call for laying a solid foundation for India at 100. And in my view, this is precisely what the Honorable Finance Minister has achieved in this budget. I call this budget a visionary budget because it effectively translates into action the great vision given by Honorable Prime Minister while addressing the nation on 15th August 2021. Sir, before I go into the heart of the budget, please allow me to point out some bloopers and blunders that were committed by some of our esteemed colleagues while speaking in this August House yesterday. First, I'll take on Sri Jawhar Sarkar. Sri Sarkar emphatically argued that the proposed expenditure on education as the ratio of GDP in the budget is only 1% of GDP. This is completely wrong. Even in 1951, we had a greater amount of expenditure, public expenditure on education. Actually, sir, the proposed expenditure on education is around 4% of GDP, not 1% of GDP. I would urge my learned friend to get his facts straight and, don't, and not mislead this August House. Secondly, nominal GDP is expected to grow at the rate of 11.1% in the next year. Economic survey, again, Mr. Chidambaram quotes, that the real GDP growth in the next year, that is financial year 2022-23, is expected to be 8%. He then questioned the finance minister, and he said, does it mean that the inflation in India in the financial year 22-23 is going to be only 3.1%? That 3.1% comes from the difference between 11.1% nominal GDP growth minus the real GDP growth of 8%. According to Sri Chidambaram, only one of the two numbers are right. One of the numbers has to be wrong. Either the nominal GDP growth number is wrong or the real GDP growth number is wrong. Not really, Chidambaram, sir. The difference between nominal GDP growth rate and the real GDP growth rate is not CPI inflation, it is not WPI inflation. The difference between the two is actually the widest measure of inflation called GDP deflator. And the inflation based on GDP deflator, which is embedded in this budget of 3.1%, is perfectly feasible. Why? Because 
the average inflation rate based on GDP deflator, and I've worked out for the last five years, five years ending the pre-COVID year of 2019-20, it turns out that the average inflation rate based on GDP deflator in our country is 3.15%, which is not very different from 3.1%, which has been incorporated in the present budget. I am really surprised, in fact, appalled that a person who has been a finance minister for a long time can make such an elementary mistake. Chairman, sir, to my mind, the most important thing about this budget is that priority has been given to economic growth over fiscal consolidation. For financial year 21-22, that is the current financial year, Honorable FM had budgeted lowering the fiscal deficit as a ratio of GDP from 9.2% to 6.8%. And the Honorable Finance Minister has nearly succeeded in hitting that target, achieving that target, posting a revised fiscal deficit of 6.9% instead of 6.8%. This is excellent fiscal marksmanship. And for the year 22-23, sir, the Honorable FM has placed a budget estimate at only moderately lower level of 6.4% of GDP. Some members questioned this and said that this number is also very large. And uh, when last time we had fiscal deficit of such large magnitude, we had an unprecedented crisis of 1991. These critics forget that during the 1991 crisis, it is true that fiscal deficit was very large, but at that time, our foreign exchange reserves were only $1 billion. Sir, today, our foreign exchange reserves are $630 billion US dollars. The situation is not comparable at all. Vice Chairman, sir, this avoidance of a sharp reduction in fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP, especially against the backdrop of buoyant tax revenues, and that too in GST, unmistakably it implies greatly enhanced public expenditure. The best thing about this budget, sir, is exceptionally large increase in capital expenditure to the tune of as much as 7.5 lakh crore. And of this enhanced capital expenditure, Again, it is noteworthy that as much as 43.3% is being devoted to building world-class infrastructure of roads, railways, and so on. The strategy underlying this budget is very clear. Sharply increased public investment would entice greater private investment. It would create more jobs, more income. In turn, that would create larger consumption demand. And to meet that demand, there would be more production, and therefore there would be more jobs. This virtuous circle will lay down the foundation of a sustained economic growth as the India transit at India 75 makes a transition to India at, the, at 100. A question is being asked, sir, in some responsible quarters. Why has the finance minister refrained from giving a big push to consumption? say through cut in direct taxes or through consumption vouchers. It is argued that increasing purchasing power in the hands of people would raise the consumption demand, it would mean greater production, and it would promote economic growth. Please conclude, uh, sir. Yes, one more minute, sir. The Honorable Finance Minister does not seem to have accepted this logic. To my mind, sir, there are at least two reasons at this point of time to prefer investment-led growth to consumption-led growth. The two reasons being the first is the number of social safety measures which were taken during the second wave of corona pandemic uh, has been very large. Recall the five mini budgets to mitigate the devastating impact of the pandemic, some of which, in fact, are continued in this budget. More importantly, while the vicious cycle of while both vicious cycle, uh, virtuous cycles, I'm sorry, while both virtuous cycles... Sorry, your one, time is over. 30 seconds, sir, 30 seconds, please. Uh, while both cycles, one consumption-led and other investment-led, both 
are correct in principle, the virtuous cycle of investment-led growth is much stronger than the virtual cy virtuous cycle of consumption-led growth. It is important to recall that economic theory talks about investment multiplier. It doesn't talk about consumption multiplier. In other words, the durable impact of enhanced public investment is much stronger Thank than you. equally large increase in consumption expenditure by government. I strongly endorse this budget 22-23. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman, sir. Thank you. The next speaker, Sri Birendra Prasad Bhaisya.